Hong Kong is a major commercial and cultural center with considerable influence throughout the world. It's a very modern city that's continually being built up. Up being the operative word. Yet it has maintained much of what is traditionally Chinese, which makes it attractive to tourists. We came to Hong Kong to see what it looks and feels like to have tomorrow being built on top of a 5,000-year-old culture. Hong Kong is clearly a modern, world-class city, but its contemporary sophistication is supported by centuries of Chinese history. You'll find an ancient temple, and across the street, a starred Michelin restaurant. Antique junks sail through the harbor, powered by Mercedes diesel engines. As I walked through the streets of Hong Kong, one of the first things I noticed was the enormous amount of signage. It's like Vegas or Times Square on steroids. And like just about everything else in Hong Kong, you can see the evolution of something ancient into something modern. Hong Kong has a number of markets in a layout that's been around for thousands of years. Streets filled with open shops where you can easily see what's for sale. Communication takes place through direct contact. You can see, smell, and often touch what is being offered. When the ancient market became Main Street, the products moved behind windows. You could touch or smell the stuff, but you could look at it. And because you were walking along the street, you could stop and control the amount of time and attention you devoted to what was being offered. These days, most of the merchandise is inside a store, and hundreds of stores are built right next to each other. People are moving through the area inside a car, they're walking quickly on a crowded street, and more and more, they are distracted by some form of handheld device. In that environment, if you want to tell people about a product, a huge and dramatic sign does a great job. It's intense during the day, and even more so at night. This is the Hong Kong goldfish market. Block after block lined with shops that sell goldfish. During the Tang Dynasty, starting in the 600s, people began the selective breeding of carp that had a genetic mutation. The result was a golden fish, and for over a thousand years, they've played a role in Chinese culture. Goldfish are valued for their extraordinary colors, elegant swimming style, and quiet temperament. These days, there are over 300 different varieties of goldfish. I understand that they can be taught to swim in a line, swarm together for feeding, and appreciate the songs of the Rolling Stones, especially I Can't Get No Satisfaction. Goldfish are a recurring theme in Chinese art. They represent wealth and success, but they also send a signal that it is possible for anyone to achieve whatever they want. If you don't have an actual goldfish living in your home, the next best thing is a painting of a goldfish. It's considered to have the same effect with a reduced level of maintenance. The harbor area in Hong Kong is named after Queen Victoria, and it dominates the landscape just like she did. The harbor is a very deep sheltered waterway, one of the world's great natural harbors. In fact, as I was looking out the window of my room, I caught a shot on my iPhone of the Queen Elizabeth sailing through. The harbor separates the island of Hong Kong from the part of the city that sits on the mainland and is called Kowloon. Its strategic location in the South China Sea made it a major trading center. 
Today, the harbor offers the most spectacular views of Hong Kong Island from one side and Kowloon from the other. For over 100 years, the Star Ferry has been running around the harbor. It's part of the city's public transportation system, but it's also a major attraction for tourists. There's a ferry that runs up and back between Hong Kong Island and Kowloon. That's the commuter. They also have a ferry that tours the harbor. In English, the word junk is used to refer to certain types of bonds and other financial instruments of questionable value, the contents of most kids' rooms, and clearly everything my Aunt Margaret brings home from the flea market. In China, the word junk means sailing ship, and it has a very particular and highly successful design that was originally developed over 2,000 years ago. In Hong Kong, a company called Aqualuna offers harbor cruises on a Chinese junk. The ship is a replica of a 19th century design that was used by a local pirate who stole from the rich and gave to the poor. Apparently, income inequality was one of his major concerns. It's one of the few remaining red sail junks, and every day it sails around the harbor. The tour takes about 45 minutes. Each of the sails on a junk has a series of horizontal bamboo strips that run from one side of the sail to the other. They're called battens. At the edge of most of the battens is a rope that allows the crew to control the shape of the sail. The sail plan on a junk also allows one sail to direct the wind into another sail, which makes it possible for the ship to move in more directions and handle better in heavy winds and rough seas. The interior of a junk is divided into separate compartments, like a stick of bamboo. Those divisions help prevent flooding and give the hull greater strength. Chinese junks also used stern-mounted rudders hundreds of years before the West. The phrase feng shui translates as wind and water. It's an ancient system for balancing the forces of nature. When feng shui is correct, the spirits are happy. But if you have too much feng and not enough shui, you're in big trouble. One of the most extraordinary examples of feng shui is Hong Kong's Intercontinental Hotel. During the early stages of its construction, a feng shui master was called in to make sure everything in the plan was properly balanced. In general, the design was OK. But the architects were from San Francisco and completely unaware that nine very powerful dragons lived nearby and the hotel was going to block the route they used every day to go for a swim in the harbor. Fortunately, dragons can easily pass through glass. So all the builders needed to do was put in a row of glass doors at the entrance to the hotel and a big glass wall on the other side of the lobby that looks out on the harbor. Actually, there are eight regular dragons, and so there are eight glass doors. The ninth dragon is the emperor, who lives with the dragons but uh, tends to bathe separately. The feng shui master also suggested that the hotel's reception desk be placed between the glass doors and the glass wall, which allows the dragons to drop off some of their wealth before they hop in the bay. These days, it serves the same function for the hotel guests. The collaboration between the feng shui master and the architects had some amazing results. In order to avoid blocking the dragon's route, the lobby lounge was created and turned out to be one of Hong Kong's great spaces. All of the walls had to be aligned with the forces of nature, which had the side effect of giving the rooms a knockout view of the harbor in Hong Kong. The hotel's presidential suite is considered to be one of the world's most luxurious. Its double-height living room has a grand piano. U.S. President Harry Truman was an excellent piano player. He would have loved this place. I always identify with presidential suites. 
You see, when I was in the fourth grade, I was the class president. Unfortunately, I spent most of the term fighting a politically motivated attempt to have me impeached. In 1900, the tire manufacturers André and Édouard Michelin decided to publish a guide for French motorists. At the time, there were only about 3,000 cars on the roads of France, and their hope was that the guide would promote the sale of cars and the Michelin tires they rode on. During the 1920s, they decided that restaurants should be included in the guides, and they hired a bunch of inspectors to make sure that only the best restaurants got into their books, with the exception of their cousin Pierre's place in Lyon, which really wasn't very good, but he was a cousin, and you know, when it's family, the rules change. In 1931, they introduced a rating system based on stars. One star meant it was a very good restaurant. Two stars indicated a level of cooking that warranted a detour from your planned itinerary. A restaurant with three stars implies a gastronomic level so high that even if you were planning on staying in your hotel room and watching reruns of Downton Abbey or whatever the equivalent was in 1931, you should get up, get in your car, the one with the Michelin tires, and drive to the restaurant. These days, Hong Kong has more Michelin-starred restaurants than any other city in the world with equal population density. In fact, Three of them are within 50 yards of each other. The steakhouse is a wine bar and grill that has been awarded a Michelin star. Its steaks come from the United States, Australia, Canada, and Argentina, and they are cooked on a charcoal grill. The wine cellar has over 3,000 bottles representing more than 500 labels, but their specialty is the big bottle. One of the really unusual things about this steakhouse is you get to choose the knife you're going to use to cut your steak. So uh, right. we offer uh, the slim one, the, the powerful and the handle. We do a bit different of the size as well. So when you enjoy the steak, you're more enjoyable. Okay. And I can pick whatever one I want and I'll get a fresh one. Can do. Okay. <laughs> the other thing they have that I liked a lot, 12 mustards. Mm. Two of them is very strong. It's like uh, the mustard with the horseradish and also the typically of the English mustard. The other, this is a Dijon and the Pommel mustard. And also we have onion, green peppercorn, garlic, chili, herbs, balsamic, grapes, horseradish, and also the honey and dew. That's awesome. <laughs> they also have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different salts yes. that I can put on my steak or my baked potato or whatever I want. Okay, let's go get a steak. Thank you. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Spoon is a Michelin one star created by Alain Ducasse, the peripatetic French chef. So today I will do a, a recipe of homemade pasta. So we have two different kinds of dough. Stefan Gortini is the executive chef, and he prepared two of his favorite dishes. Homemade pasta with green asparagus and black truffles, and a cook pot of seasonal vegetables and fruit. So me and my recipe, I decided to do the, the pasta right. round. So just we will cut it. So basically, me, I will use only the head of asparagus for this recipe. This part, of course, we don't throw away, we keep. Huh? We can do a soup, we can do a puree, we can do a lot of things uh, with this part of the asparagus. Huh? When you have uh, this part, huh? We used to say epicote, it's a remove this part. Red, small baby red onion. I've never seen that, it's a baby red onion. Yes. Far out. Here you will see, so we will start with olive oil. We will sweat a little bit the asparagus. We will add the onion and we will deglaze with a stock. So me, it is a chicken stock. Okay. And when it is boiling, now we'll add our pasta inside. So different, really yes. interesting. 
Because it's fresh dough, it'll cook in a minute. Yes, it's cooking very, very fast. And now, you will see time to cook. We will reduce the juice and everything will be cooked together and all the flavor will stay together. We just miss one thing, it is the truffle. truffle. Just must to try every time for the seasoning. Eh? Sure. So we have our puree hot. Just I will put at the bottom. So just we will look like this. Fabulous. We'll put the juice on what we have inside. Please take a spoon and try. Mm -hmm. It's the dish my grandmother never made. <laughs> We put the finished pasta dish on the table so we could come back later and shoot what we called the beauty shot. However, while we were filming, my son ate it. Yanto He means the place you like to hang out with the great view. It has been awarded two stars by Michelin and is considered to be one of the best Chinese restaurants in the world. Its signature dish is Peking duck. The recipe starts with the duck being boiled in water for a while. Then the duck hangs around in the kitchen for a day or two. Then it gets roasted in the oven and basted with hot oil. At your table, the skin is sliced off, placed on a freshly cooked pancake, and dressed with an assortment of vegetables and sauces. Many restaurants have a sommelier that advises guests on the selection of wines. This restaurant has a sommelier that advises guests on the selection of tea and which tea goes with which food. I couldn't cover the restaurant scene in Hong Kong without visiting Nobu. The Nobu restaurants feature a style of Japanese cooking reminiscent of the countryside in Japan where Nobu grew up. Years ago, I worked on a great book about cooking equipment called The Cook's Catalog, and Nobu wrote the section on Japanese equipment. I've been a fan ever since. Sean Mel is the executive chef here, and he's going to make two dishes. The first is foie gras with pickled cherry on homemade bao toast. The second is baked king crab in a sea of urchin butter. So this is just a house-made bao bun. Uh, bao, typically when you're in, the, uh, in, in Asia and China, uh, you get the pork cha su stuffed inside the okay. bao, and they get steamed. Yeah. Uh, so same idea, the only thing that we're doing here is not filling it with anything. Uh, later, after it's steamed and cooled down, we'll use these as actually a play on if you would get foie gras and brioche in a French restaurant. Right. Uh, so this is just, I guess, more Asian, more Japanese feel to it. Just to kind of ensure that they get uh, smoothness on top. You roll them out, and then you kind of fold them in and under oh, on the bottom. got it. Okay. So it kind of tightens the top. Okay. See how it kind of smooths it out, gets a little flat. And then right. you just want to pat it down. I have a distinct great. feeling I'm going to be in remedial dough making. <laughs> This is the, uh, the bow after it's done. These, are, these have been steamed already. Okay. Nice soft. And then once we start cooking these, they'll actually get softer. So it'll, it'll soften up quite a bit. Uh, this is our foie gras. We import it from uh, France. Uh, it's Roche foie, so very high quality, very good. But in the meantime, uh, this is actually our sweet onion sauce that we've got here. We're gonna start reducing. Uh, so this we make in-house as well. Uh, start off with caramelized onions. Uh, we deglaze a little sake, a little soy, uh, some mirin. <clears throat> this actually gets a uh, cooked with wagyu fat as well, the uh, sweet onion sauce. She just sauteed that for a minute or two. Just a minute, just to kind of get the uh, okay. outside charred. We actually start these in the pan while it's a little bit uh, cold still. The uh, reason being is, you know, you want the bow to get nice and crispy on the outside. Now our bow are just uh, toasted to our liking. Nice little golden brown. 
We'll start building our uh, little mini bow here. Why does that smell good? Thank you. And then this is just a little bit of micro shervil. Kind of give it a little bit of uh, herbaceousness and a little extra balance there. And that is the foie gras toasted bell. Fabulous. Yeah. And this is the Hong Kong Jade Market. It's made up of a series of booths selling things made of jade and an assortment of souvenirs. Jade has been an important element in Chinese culture for at least 6,000 years. There are two basic types of jade. One is nephrite. The more iron it contains, the greener the color. The second is jadeite. It is softer than nephrite and much more difficult to find. We think of jade as being green, but it actually comes in a number of colors, including white and black. The Chinese consider jade to be more valuable than gold. My favorite jade dealer at the Hong Kong market is Alice at Stand 148. Good jade and good English. It's my understanding that different forms of jade can protect you and help you with things with your life, okay? Mm -hmm. We like to pick out two things, mm -hmm. one to protect Nicholas, one to protect me. You have looking. This one is a different year for the oh, Chinese. horoscope, got mm -hmm. it, okay. Yes. What Mine year you? 2005, so the rooster. Oh, rooster. Okay, rooster is a happiness. And yes. I am the year of the tiger. Oh, tiger is a long life and good health. Ah. Well, this one is a rooster. It's a very nice, very fun, very happy. Okay. And then you have looking the tiger. Tiger is a very stronger. Tiger is a good health and long life. Uh, very good. Very good. Right. You want to mm. put it in your pocket or you want to hang it? I want something I can wear around my neck. Nah, you have looking. Very pretty, the rooster. So many different shades of yeah, green and yeah. light. Uh, yeah, uh, you said. Very nice and very pretty. A friend of mine who lives in Hong Kong told me that if you have a jade charm and it breaks, you should be pleased. It means that a piece of bad luck was heading towards you and the jade protected you by taking the hit. Over the centuries, jade has come to be associated with immortality, beauty, courage, wisdom, justice, and compassion. A white jade charm is thought to give the wearer special skills, including the ability to accurately forecast the failure rate of mortgage-backed securities. Apparently, no one at Standard & Poor's, Moody's, or Fitch ratings we're aware of this bit of folklore. Well, that's Hong Kong. It's kind of like a layer cake. The base is 5,000 years of Chinese culture, and there's a midsection of modern and a light dusting of the future on top. For Travels and Traditions, I'm Bert Wolf. Ah, uh, but wait, there's more. Whenever we edit one of our programs, we always end up with more good material than we can fit in. Interviews, stories, recipes. So we decided to put them on our website, BertWolf.com.